sing a lullaby. When in compliance with Lingard's abrupt demand, Almayer consented to wed the Malay girl, no one knew that on the day when the interesting young convert had lost all her natural relations and found a white father, she had been fighting desperately like the rest of them on board the prow, and was only prevented from leaping overboard, like the few other survivors, by a severe wound in the leg. There, on the foredeck of the prow, old Lingard found her under a heap of dead and dying pirates, and had her carried on the poop of the flash before the melee craft was set on fire and sent adrift. She was conscious, and in the great peace and stillness of the tropical evening, succeeding the turmoil of the battle, she watched all she held dear on earth after her own savage manner, drifting away into the gloom in a great roar of flame and smoke. She lay there unheeding, the careful hands attending to her wound, silent and absorbed in gazing at the funeral pile of those brave men she had so much admired and so well helped in their contest with the redoubtable Raja Leut. The light night breeze fanned the brig gently to the southward, and the great blaze of light got smaller and smaller till it twinkled only on the horizon like a setting star. It set the heavy canopy of smoke reflected the glare of hidden flames for a short time and then disappeared also. She realized that with the vanishing gleam of her old life departed too. Thenceforth there was slavery in the far countries, among strangers, in unknown and perhaps terrible surroundings. Being fourteen years old, she realized her position and came to that conclusion the only one possible to a Malay girl, soon ripened under a tropical sun, and not unaware of her personal charms, of which she heard many a young brave warrior of her father's crew express an appreciative admiration. There was in her the dread of the unknown. Otherwise, she accepted her position calmly, after the manner of her people and even considered it quite natural, for was she not a daughter of warriors, conquered in battle, and did she not belong rightfully to the victorious Raja? Even the evident kindness of the terrible old man must spring, she thought, from admiration for his captive, and the flattered vanity eased for her the pangs of sorrow after such an awful calamity. Perhaps had she known of the high walls, the quiet gardens, and the silent nuns of the Samarang convent where her destiny was leading her, she would have sought death in her dread and hate of such a restraint. But in imagination she pictured her to herself the usual life of a Malay girl, the usual succession of heavy work and fierce love, of intrigues, gold ornaments, of domestic drudgery, and of that great but occult influence which is one of the few rights of half-savage womankind. But her destiny in the rough hands of the old sea dog, acting under unreasoning impulses of the heart, took a strange and to her a terrible shape. She bore it all, the restraint and the teaching and the new faith, with calm submission concealing her hate and contempt for all that new life. She learned the language very easily, yet understood but little of the new faith the good sisters taught her, assimilating quickly only the superstitious elements of the religion. She called Lingard father gently and caressingly at each of his short and noisy visits under the clear impression that he was a great and dangerous power it was good to propitiate. Was he not now her master? And during those long four years 
she nourished the hope of finding favor in his eyes and ultimately becoming his wife, counselor, and guide. Those dreams of the future were dispelled by the Raja Leut's fiat, which made Almayer's fortune, as that young man fondly hoped, and, dressed in the hateful finery of Europe, the center of an interested circle of Batavian society, the young convert stood before the altar with an unknown and sulky-looking white man, for Almayer was uneasy, a little disgusted, and greatly inclined to run away. A judicious fear of the adopted father-in-law and a just regard for his own material welfare prevented him from making a scandal. Yet while swearing fidelity, he was concocting plans for getting rid of the pretty Millet girl in a more or less distant future. She, however, had retained enough of conventual teaching to understand well that according to white men's laws, she was going to be Almayer's companion and not his slave, and promised to herself to act accordingly. So when the flash freighted with materials for building a new house, left the harbor of Batavia, taking away the young couple into the unknown Borneo, she did not carry on her deck so much love and happiness as old Lingard was wont to boast of before his casual friends in the verandas of various hotels. The old seaman himself was perfectly happy. Now he had done his duty by the girl. You know, I made her an orphan, he often concluded solemnly, when talking about his own affairs to a scratch audience of shore loafers, as it was his habit to do. And the approbative shouts of his half-intoxicated auditors filled his simple soul with delight and pride. I carry everything right through, was another of his sayings, and in pursuance of that principle, he pushed the building of house and go-downs on the Pante River with feverish haste. The house for the young couple, the go-downs for the big trade Almayer was going to develop, while he, Lingard, would be able to give himself up to some mysterious work which was only spoken of in hints, but was understood to relate to gold and diamonds in the interior of the island. Almayer was impatient too. Had he known what was before him, he might not have been so eager and full of hope as he stood watching the last canoe of the Lingard expedition disappear in the bend up the river. When Turning round, he beheld the pretty little house, the big go-downs, built neatly by an army of Chinese carpenters, the new jetty round which were clustered the trading canoes. He felt the sudden elation and the thought that the world was his. But the world had to be conquered first, and its conquest was not so easy as he thought. He was very soon made to understand that he was not wanted in that corner of it where old Lingard and his own weak will placed him in the midst of unscrupulous intrigues and of a fierce trade competition. The Arabs had found out the river, had established a trading post in Sambir, and where they traded they would be masters and suffer no rival. Lingard returned unsuccessful from his first expedition and departed again, spending all the profits of the legitimate trade on his mysterious journeys. Almayer struggled with the difficulties of his position, friendless and unaided, save for the protection given to him for Lingard's sake by the old Raja, the predecessor of Lakamba. Lakamba himself then living as a private individual on a rice clearing seven miles down the river, exercised all his influence towards the help of the white man's enemies, plotting against the old Raja and the Almayer with a certainty of combination, pointing clearly to a profound knowledge of their most secret affairs. Outwardly friendly, his portly form was often to be seen on Almayer's veranda, 
his green turban and gold-embroidered jacket shone in the front rank of the decorous throng of Malays coming to greet Lingard on his returns from the interior. His salams were of the lowest and his handshakings of the heartiest when welcoming the old trader, but his small eyes took in the signs of the times, and he departed from those interviews with a satisfied and furtive smile to hold long consultations with his friend and ally, Saeed Abdullah, the chief of the Arab trading post, a man of great wealth and of great influence in the islands. It was currently believed at that time in the settlement that Lakamba's visits to Almeyer's house were not limited to those official interviews. Often on moonlight nights, the belated fishermen of Sambira saw a small canoe shooting out from the narrow creek at the back of the white man's house, and the solitary occupant paddled cautiously down the river in the deep shadows of the bank, and those events duly reported were discussed round the evening fires far into the night with the cynicism of expression common to aristocratic malaise and with a malicious pleasure in the domestic misfortunes of the Orang Blondo, the hated Dutchman. Almeyer went on struggling desperately, but with a feebleness of purpose depriving him of all chance of success against men so unscrupulous and resolute as his rivals, the Arabs. The trade fell away from the large go-downs, and the go-downs themselves rotted piecemeal. The old man's banker, Puddig of Makassar, failed, and with this went the whole available capital. The profits of past years had been swallowed up in Lingard's exploring craze. Lingard was in the interior, perhaps dead, at all events giving no sign of life. Almeyer stood alone in the midst of those adverse circumstances, deriving only a little comfort from the companionship of his little daughter, born two years after the marriage, and at the time some six years old. His wife had soon commenced to treat him with a savage contempt expressed by sulky silence, only occasionally varied by a flood of savage invective. He felt she hated him, and saw her jealous eyes watching himself and the child with almost an expression of hate. She was jealous of the little girl's evident preference for the father, and Almeyer felt he was not safe with that woman in the house. While she was burning the furniture and tearing down the pretty curtains in her unreasoning hate of those signs of civilization, Almeyer cowed by these outbursts of savage nature, meditated in silence on the best way of getting rid of her. He thought of everything, even planned murder in an undecided and feeble sort of way, but dared do nothing, expecting every day the return of Lingard with the news of some immense good fortune. But he returned indeed, but aged, ill, a ghost of his former self, with the fire of fever burning in his sunken eyes, almost the only survivor of the numerous expedition. But he was successful at last. Untold riches were in his grasp. He wanted more money, only a little more, to realize a dream of fabulous fortune and Huddig had failed. Almeyer scraped all he could together, but the old man wanted more. If Almeyer could not get it, he would go to Singapore, to Europe even, but before all to Singapore, and he would take the little Nina with him. The child must be brought up decently. He had good friends in Singapore who would take care of her and have her taught properly. All would be well, and that girl, upon whom the old seaman seemed to have transferred all his former affection for the mother, would be the richest woman in the East, in the whole world even. So old Lingard shouted, pacing the veranda with his heavy quarter-deck step, 
gesticulating with a smoldering cheroot, ragged, disheveled, enthusiastic, and Almayer, sitting huddled up on a pile of mats, thought with dread of the separation with the only human being he loved, with greater dread still, perhaps, of the scene with his wife, the savage tigress, deprived of her young. She will poison me, thought the poor wretch, while aware of that easy and final manner of solving the social, political, or familial or family problems in Malay life. To his great surprise, she took the news very quietly, giving only him and Lingard a furtive glance and saying not a word. This, however, did not prevent her the next day from jumping into the river and swimming after the boat in which Lingard was carrying away the nurse with the screaming child. Almayer had to give chase with his whaleboat and drag her in by the hair in the midst of cries and curses enough to make heaven fall. Yet after two days spent in wailing, she returned to her former mode of life, chewing betel nut and sitting all day amongst her women in stupefied idleness. She aged very rapidly after that and only roused herself from her apathy to acknowledge by a scathing remark or an insulting exclamation the accidental presence of her husband. He had built for her a riverside hut in the compound where she dwelt in perfect seclusion. Lacamba's visits had ceased when, by a convenient decree of providence and the help of a little scientific manipulation, the old ruler of Sambir departed this life. Lakamba reigned in his stead now, having been well served by his Arab friends with the Dutch authorities. Said Abdullah was the great man and the traitor of the Pante. Almayer lay ruined and helpless under the close meshed net of their intrigues owing his life only to his supposed knowledge of Lingard's valuable secret. Lingard had disappeared. He wrote once from Singapore, saying the child was well and under the care of a Mrs. Vink, and that he himself was going to Europe to raise money for the great enterprise. He was coming back soon. There would be no difficulties, he wrote. People would rush in with their money. Evidently, they did not, for there was only one letter more from him saying he was ill, had found no relation living, but little else besides. Then came a complete silence. Europe had swallowed up the Raja Leut, apparently, and Almayer looked vainly westward for a ray of light out of the gloom of his shattered hopes. Years passed and the rare letters from Mrs. Vink, later on from the girl herself, were the only thing to be looked to to make life bearable amongst the triumphant savagery of the river. Almayer lived now alone, having even ceased to visit his debtors who would not pay, sure of Lakamba's protection. The faithful Sumatrice Ali cooked his rice and made his coffee, for he dared not trust anyone else, and least of all his wife. He killed time wandering sadly in the overgrown paths round the house, visiting the ruined go-downs, where a few brass guns covered with verdigris and only a few broken cases of moldering Manchester goods reminded him of the good early times when all this was full of life and merchandise, and he overlooked a busy scene on the river bank, his little daughter by his side. Now the upcountry canoes glided past the little rotten wharf of a Lingard and company to paddle up the Pante branch and cluster round the new jetty belonging to Abdullah. Not that they loved Abdullah, but they dared not trade with the man whose star had set. Had they done so, they knew there was no mercy to be expected from Arab or Raja. 
no rice to be got on credit in the times of scarcity from either, and no mayor could not help them, having at times hardly enough for himself. A mayor, in his isolation and despair, often envied his near neighbor, the Chinaman, Jim Ng, whom he could see stretched on a pile of cool mats, a wooden pillow under his head, an opium pipe in his nerveless fingers. He did not seek, however, consolation in opium. Perhaps it was too expensive. Perhaps his white man's pride saved him from that degradation. But most likely, it was the thought of his little daughter and the far-off straits settlements. He heard from her oftener since Abdullah bought a steamer, which ran now between Singapore and the Pate settlement every three months or so. Almeyer felt himself nearer his daughter. He longed to see her and planned a voyage to Singapore, but put off his departure from year to year, always expecting some favorable turn of fortune. He did not want to meet her with empty hands and with no words of hope on his lips. He could not take her back into that savage life to which he was condemned himself. He was also a little afraid of her. What would she think of him? He reckoned the years. A grown woman, a civilized woman, young and hopeful, while he felt old and hopeless, and very much like those savages round him. He asked himself what was going to be her future. He could not answer that question, and he dared not face her, and yet he longed after her. He hesitated for years. His hesitation was put an end to by Nina's unexpected appearance in Sambir. She arrived in the steamer under the captain's care. Almayer beheld her with surprise, not unmixed with wonder. During those ten years, the child had changed into a woman. Black-haired, olive-skinned, tall and beautiful, with great sad eyes, where the startled expression common to Malay womankind was modified by a thoughtful tinge inherited from her European ancestry. Almeyer thought with dismay of the meeting of his wife and daughter, of what his grave girl in European clothes would think of her beetle-nut-chewing mother squatting in a dark hut disorderly, half-naked and sulky. He also feared an outbreak of temper on the part of the pest of a woman he had hitherto managed to keep tolerably quiet, thereby saving the remnants of his dilapidated furniture. And he stood there, before the closed door of the hut, in the blazing sunshine, listening to the murmur of voices, wondering what went on inside, wherefrom all the servant maids had been expelled at the beginning of the interview, and now stood clustered by the palings with half-covered faces and a chatter of curious speculation. He forgot himself there, trying to catch a stray word through the bamboo walls, till the captain of the steamer, who had walked up with the girl, fearing a sunstroke, took him under the arm and led him into the shade of his own veranda, where Nina's trunk stood already, having been landed by the steamer's men. As soon as Captain Ford had his glass before him and his cheroot lighted, Almayer asked for the explanation of his daughter's unexpected arrival. Ford said little beyond generalizing in vague but violent terms upon the foolishness of women in general and of Mrs. Vink in particular. You know, Caspar, said he in conclusion to the excited Almayer, it is deucedly awkward to have a half-caste girl in the house. There's such a lot of fools about. There was that young fellow from the bank who used to ride to the Vink bungalow early and late. That old woman thought it was for that Emma of hers. When she found out what he wanted exactly, there was a row, I can tell you. She would not have Nina, not an hour longer, in the house. Fact is, I heard of this affair and took the girl to my wife. 
My wife is a pretty good woman, as women go, and upon my word, we would have kept the girl for you, only she would not stay. Now, then, don't flare up, Caspar. Sit still. What can you do? It is better so. Let her stay with you. She was never happy over there. Those two Vink girls are no better than dressed up monkeys. They slighted her. You can't make her white. It's no use you swearing at me. You can't. She's a good girl for all that, but she would not tell my wife anything. If you want to know, ask her yourself. But if I was you, I would leave her alone. You are welcome to her passage money, old fellow, if you are short now. And the skipper, throwing away his cigar, walked off to wake them up on board, as he expressed it. Al Mayer vainly expected to hear of the cause of his daughter's return from his daughter's lips. Not that day, not on any other day, did she ever allude to her Singapore life. He did not care to ask, awed by the calm impassiveness of her face, by those solemn eyes looking past him on the great, still forests, sleeping in majestic repose to the murmur of the broad river, he accepted the situation, happy in the gentle and protecting affection the girl showed him, fitfully enough, for she had, as she called it, her bad days when she used to visit her mother and remain long hours in the riverside hut, coming out as inscrutable as ever, but with a contemptuous look and a short word ready to answer any of his speeches. He got used to even to that, and on those days kept quiet, although greatly alarmed by his wife's influence upon the girl. Otherwise, Nina adapted herself wonderfully to the circumstances of a half-savage and miserable life. She accepted without question or apparent disgust the neglect, the decay, the poverty of the household, the absence of furniture, and the preponderance of rice diet on the family table. She lived with Almayer in the little house, now sadly decaying, built originally by Lingard for the young couple. The Malays eagerly discussed her arrival. There were, at the beginning, crowded levies of Malay women with their children, seeking eagerly after Ubat for all the ills of the flesh from the young Mem Pute. In the cool of the evening, grave Arabs in long white shirts and yellow sheepless jackets walked slowly on the dusty path by the riverside towards Almayer's gate and made solemn calls upon that unbeliever under shallow pretenses of business, only to get a glimpse of the young girl in a highly decorous manner. Even La Camba, came out of his stockade in a great pomp of war canoes and red umbrellas and landed on the rotten little jetty of Lingard and Company. He came, he said, to buy a couple of brass guns as a present to his friend, the chief of Sambir Dayaks. And while Almayer, suspicious but polite, busied himself in unearthing the old pop guns and the go-downs, the Raja sat on a chair in the veranda, surrounded by his respectful retinue, awaiting in vain for Nina's appearance. She was in one of her bad days, and remained in her mother's hut, watching with her the ceremonious proceedings on the veranda. The Raja departed, baffled but courteous, and soon Almayer began to reap the benefit of improved relations with the ruler in the shape of the recovery of some debts, paid to him with many apologies and many a low salam by debtors until then considered hopelessly insolvent. Under these improving circumstances, Almayer brightened up a little. All was not lost, perhaps. Those Arabs and Malays saw at last that he was a man of some ability, he thought, and he began after his manner, to plan great things, to dream of great fortunes for himself and Nina, especially for Nina, 
Under these vivifying impulses, he asked Captain Ford to write to his friends in England, making inquiries after Lingard. Was he alive or dead? If dead, had he left any papers, documents, any indications or hints as to his great enterprise? Meantime, he had found amongst the rubbish in one of the empty rooms a notebook belonging to the old adventurer. He studied the crabbed handwriting of its pages and often grew meditative over it. Other things also woke him from his apathy. The stir made in the whole of the island by the establishment of the British Borneo Company affected even the sluggish flow of the Pantay life. Great changes were expected. Annexation was talked of. The Arabs grew civil. Al Mayer began building his new house for the use of the future engineers, agents, or settlers of the new company. He spent every available gilder on it with a confiding heart. One thing only disturbed his happiness. His wife came out of her seclusion, importing her green jacket, scant sarongs, shrill voice, and witch-like appearance into his quiet life in the bungalow and his daughter seemed to accept that savage intrusion into their daily existence with wonderful equanimity. He did not like it, but dared say nothing.